I'm excited to welcome two awesome founders and CEOs who had the courage to take on competitive industries and build successful brands. Thanks for joining us. Thanks Happy for having to be here. Us. And so you guys have a lot in common. Um, you both have feminine yet down-to-earth brands. How have you been able to craft an image that, that developed a loyal following? Sure. Uh, with Outdoor Voices, we're focused on building the next great activewear brand um, and focused on creating a brand that celebrates activity for the joy of it rather than the pressure to perform. So I looked at the activewear space and said, there's so many people who want to be more active, yet you walk into one of these traditional macho retailers, look up on the wall, and, and it's an image of like a sweaty, big, muscly guy. And you're like, hey, that's not going to be me for two years or ever. So I uh, <laughs> wanted to create a brand that approached activity differently differently with moderation, ease, humor, and delight, and sponsor recreational activities rather than uh, like competitive or performance activities where the goal is to cross the finish line first. And, and so you had a, a blog actually, Into the Gloss. How did you use that to help build a following for Glossier? Sure, so as, as a big beauty fan myself with an editorial background in magazines, uh, I really wanted to create a uh, modern beauty brand that would celebrate beauty in real life and create uh, a brand that really celebrates beauty as an element of personal style. In this YouTube age, um, it's really possible for every woman to be her own expert. Uh, beauty brands are no longer really able to decide what the customer thinks of them anymore. And so um, we're really looking to democratize beauty uh, from a brand perspective by being the first uh, digitally native direct-to-consumer brand um, that uh, creates accessible luxury beauty products. And one thing that I found interesting is that you were telling me that you took a different approach than a lot of businesses that started online. You actually went offline and you went to different races to help uh, spread the word about Outdoor Voices. Can you tell me a little bit more about that approach? Yeah, well, we were born online, so we're a digital first company, but we focus on driving engagement offline and then amplifying through social and digital channels. So things like sponsoring activities that are happening in real life, people who are jogging, taking their dogs for walks, people out there on the trail hiking together. How does Outdoor Voices go to where the recreational electricity is, sponsor those activities, and then see it amplified through things like Instagram on social and digital. And um, you actually used Instagram mm -hmm. heavily in your early days, and, and you really credit it with part of the success behind Glossier. Um, how do you use social media to advance your brand? Sure, so um, beauty is a huge category on social media, um, one of the biggest on YouTube. And we actually launched Glossier on Instagram before we uh, had a website, before we um, had a brand. We built that brand in real time through the at Glossier Instagram account. Um, and by the time we launched, we had a really uh, excited fan base. And so to date, um, we have about 100% uh, growth so far this year in terms of new followers on Instagram. We have about 550,000 followers, and uh, our engagement rate is about 3.2%, um, which is twice the industry average for beauty. So um, what we've seen really works for us on Instagram is uh, mimicking and leading the witness, so to speak, in terms of um, women sharing their beauty routines in their entire cabinet which again is something that beauty brands have been reluctant to do to really acknowledge that the customer is shopping across many different brands. And you guys obviously both target a lot of women, although you guys have men's clothing as well, but how would you define your target demographic? I think you've called it a psychographic. Yes, um, so the Glossier uh, girl or woman is, is, is not a certain age. We have a largely millennial um, following based on uh, our distribution channel, uh, but you know, it's really for any woman who aspires to be proud of who she is every day. What about Outdoor Voices? What's yeah. your demographic? We think of activity as ageless and shapeless. So same thing. It's all about tapping into this recreational mindset. So people who are out there being active because it makes them feel good um, talk about it as kinetic meditation rather than trying to be the best or the fastest or, or be um, you know, the best in their category. So uh, the other thing is we, we always say it starts with us. So we're creating product and building a community around us and our friends, um, and that is where that's been our kind of true north in terms of building this company. And you guys not only have these communities, you also have celebrities who you're not paying. Both of you have a lot of celebrities. Lena Dunham was an early fan of Outdoor Voices. Gwyneth Paltrow is a fan and a now investor. You had celebrities at the Oscars wearing Glossier on the red carpet. So how are you attracting their attention and, and how do they play a role in, in expanding your business? 
Uh, so, especially in beauty, I mean, this this has a you know beauty as a as a category has a really long history of um, paying celebrity influencers. And uh, what we really believe at Glossier is um, in this organic growth. Seventy percent of our growth last year was uh, through own, uh, through owned or earned channels um, and was organic. So, uh, when celebrities you know like Glossier, I mean, it's great when Kim Kardashian Instagrams a soothing face mist, um, you know, and we see that uh, and we didn't pay for it. Um, but we really see every one of our customers customers as being an influencer. In, in this day and age, every woman can be her own author um, and has that authorship, and we really encourage that. So we've seen some of our, our largest um, you know, sales and, and, and conversion come through uh, you know, blog posts from just you know, our customers or through Instagram accounts from our customers. And, and so, yeah, tell us a little bit about your relationship with Gwyneth Paltrow and some yeah. of the things you've done with celebrities. Yeah, um, both Lena and Gwyneth are fans of the brand. They first got introduced to the product and then wanted to get more involved, so Gwyneth is an investor. But uh, similar to Glossier, uh, we are focused on our customer base and not, not focused on paying for celebrity support. Um, one thing we talk about a lot is um, how do you take this notion of sponsorship, so a Steph Curry sponsored by Under Armour who gets paid millions and millions of dollars, and take that sponsorship to our customer, uh, customer base. So the true recreationalists that are out there doing things, moving their body, having fun with friends on a daily basis, and really focused on kind of these micro-influencers, people who are uh, already engaging with the brand and, and continuing to focus on growing that core set. And so would you ever do any formal product collaborations or, or partnerships with either, either influencers or, or other brands? Uh, well, we've, we've partnered with our customer base in, in various ways. So um, it's interesting because as a you know, former editor uh, in magazines, um, the editors today really are your customers. And so we do a lot of community building, a lot of activations across uh, different um, cities in the US and soon globally uh, when we expand uh, to the UK and Canada later this year. Um, and it's really for us about creating these, these moments for women to come and connect. It's interesting, uh, at our showroom in New York, which is our first retail um, store, it's open seven days a week, uh, the majority of the people who are talking and helping one another are our customers. So the showroom editors uh, are few and far between up there, and it's really you just see the customers saying, oh, you know, I, I, you're really a medium. I think you're medium. You know, I have that concealer. And so um, it really just goes to show that, uh, you know, this, this community is, is really building upon itself. Yeah, and actually one thing you're both doing that's interesting is, and we're seeing this a lot in e-commerce, is that you have like pop-up shops and stores. And so how, how are you doing this? Are you planning to expand and have more brick and mortar businesses for selling your items? Yeah, um, to date our greatest customer acquisition tool has been in real life. So through field marketing events, through stores, we have four uh, stores currently and four more coming this year. And we don't purely look at them as revenue drivers, they're really about driving community. So um, through these stores we, ha we host things like OV Joggers Club uh, or OV Dog Walking Club um, and really give the customer a reason to, to hook on to the OV community apart in addition to the really good product. And so do you plan to expand and add more stores? Absolutely, so um, we're calling it Unlocking the West Coast. We're opening LA um, and SF in the later portion of this year. What about Glossier? What, what should we expect on the, the brick and mortar front? Sure, so I mean, we, we really think a lot and spend you know, the majority of our time thinking about how to reinvent the beauty experience online. Uh, one, of the, you know, one of our goals is really, she shouldn't need to go try on a product uh, in person in order to, to, to understand what it's going to look like on her skin. Um, and uh, that being said, I think similar to, to Outdoor Voices, uh, our offline experience so far has, has really been about um, how do you create a sort of community activation space. How do you bring the brand to life? Not how do you show the products, but how do you really experience the brand? Um, and so we've created these kind of clubhouse sort of meccas in, in our own small way um, for, for women to come and, and really share their love of the brand. And what's interesting is um, while the sales are through the roof and like defying all, all, all odds, it's, it's really fun to watch. Um, what's more interesting is the UGC that's coming out of these experiences. Uh, what's more interesting are the girls who come once a week just because just because they want to feel the energy in the room. Um, and I can't say that about, you know, large beauty retailers. 
I think there's something uh, with both Glossier and Outdoor Voices where we're taking traditionally um, intimidating spaces mm -hmm. like the beauty industry and the activewear industry and making them all about being human. We talk about it a lot about being human, not superhuman, um, and our physical locations are a place to bring that to life. Mm -hmm. uh, we hear a lot that people think of Outdoor Voices as their best friend, um, and I think Glossier similarly. Super uh, friendly, approachable, uh, fun. We think of uh, Outdoor Voices as the hiking buddy that brought the snacks. So <laughs> it's not someone talking down to you, it's rather someone on the hiking trail grabbing your hand and pulling you along with you. Um, and that's informed in, in how we communicate from text message to right. kind of more informal uh, copy through emails, et cetera. And, and I think just adding on, you know, our, our editors, myself, I mean, I, I don't have a beauty editor background. I'm just a girl who, you know, has opinions about her beauty products. And but I you did work at Vogue. I did, but that was in fashion. <laughs> And, um, and, and, you know, our showroom editors that we hire even offline, and as well as our editors who uh, run our, our customer experience um, online, they are really just girls sharing, you know, what they know. They're not necessarily experts. And again, you know, we're moving away from this in beauty, from this idea that there's, you know, one brand or one person who can tell you everything about your face. I'm really impressed that you guys are both taking on these gigantic industries. I mean, there's Sephora, which has a lot of different beauty brands. Um, you know, Estee Lauder, they own pretty much everything. And then you're, you're taking on Nike and Lululemon. And so how are you, and you've mentioned some of it with the branding, but how are you really able to make a dent in these industries? Um, so for Glossier, we are uh, the first beauty lifestyle brand, and I think that has to do with two things. One, it has to do with our product assortment, where uh, because we're online, we don't have to decide which side of Sephora we are going to be on, skincare or makeup. We can create you know, anything in any category, and in fact, we're, we're launching into two new categories this year. Um, and the second thing, which is I think the more important thing, is uh, Lifestyle to me means it's, it's something that you carry with you throughout your day that you really relate to that represents you know, your values and kind of gives you a kind of you know, um, armor or becomes that friend. And so Glossier is really, I think, the first brand that um, you have multiple touch points throughout your day with that brand. You're not just using this moisturizer once in the morning and that's your only experience with Glossier. You're following us on Instagram, you're getting our emails, um, you know, you're being invited to events, you're on our uh, private Slack channel for you know, top customers and reps, um, you have your stickers, the Glossier stickers on the back of your iPhone that you can see in, in selfies. So um, we have this really intimate relationship with her where that, that G logo really means something to a, you know, a woman in Europe as much as it does to a, a girl in Ohio. And you guys both like to be associated with, with quality, but how do you build quality at an affordable price? Yeah, I mean, product is uh, where we started and making good product that uh, is for comfort and movement is kind of uh, our product development framework um, or what leads us. Uh, and so we started with a thing called OB Kits, which is your recreation essentials, your uniform for activity. Um, and most recently uh, launched something called the OB Kit Shop, where it focuses you around a very uh, few set of specific pieces, tops and bottoms that you can mix and match um, kind of for your recreational preference. Whereas traditionally in the activewear space, there's tons of options, leggings over here, tops over here, and we've created this experience that consolidates it and makes OV kind of the recommendation service or authority on the best outfit for any, any given uh, activity. And you, you make your stuff in China. I know there's a lot of talk about manufacturing things in the U.S. these days. Would you ever move that to the U.S. or do oh, you yeah. feel like it needs to be in China? Yeah, we, uh, it doesn't need to be in China, but we, to make the best quality product, you have to work with the vendors that um, have the systems, processes, and teams set up to do so. I actually just got back from a chip trip to Vietnam and Taiwan. Um, we're working with the largest manufacturer for Under Armour and Lulu, and it's, a li it's like a resort over there. It's beautiful. <laughs> uh, all, the, all the buildings are LEED certified, so I feel very proud to work with best-in-class partners. Um, but that being said, it's certainly uh, a conversation we're having with these folks. How do we invest in creating kind of these manufacturing systems uh, locally, um, so absolutely top of mind. Got it. And you, your stuff is made in in the U.S. Is that right? The majority of it is, but um, beauty is is interesting. It's a lot like fashion, where if you want, you know, the best leather shoes, you need, you know, you go to Italy, or you want the best cashmere, it's from this place. So, 
funnily enough, if you want the best eyeliner, there's like one place in Germany where you need to you know, go make your eyeliner. So we take a product by product approach, but really putting the customer first. So the last thing we wanted to do was roll out you know, 150 SKUs at launch. We actually launched with only four products. And to date, we have about 19 products. So um, it's a very, very, we, very uh, narrow uh, collection of modern essentials for, um, for every woman, very universally flattering. Uh, and we take care to, to really make and celebrate every single launch. So I, I liken it to when a new um, Harry Potter book comes out or something like that. You know, the, the Glossier product, the new one comes out every two to three months. Um, and it, it, it really is, it's sort of this snowball effect. Every product sort of takes on a life of its own and um, really gets, gets celebrated and gets integrated into, into this larger community's routine. You recently announced that you're going to hire about 300 more people, which you only have about 75 people right now. We have about 90 people. 90. Okay, yeah. so, so you're going to quadruple more than that. Your your uh, staff. Are you worried about that you're hiring too many people at once? That it's going to change the culture of your business? Um, I mean, I personally spend about 50% of my day on people and and culture, and um, that's actually going to be over the course of the next 10 years. So so we have a little bit of time, but uh, certainly I think it's something that any you know good CEO thinks about. And um, I think it's really important for us that we stick to you know our core values when we're hiring, and um, and continue to 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 really bring people into the fold who who believe in the mission and um, and who can add their own special sauce. And what about expansion? Right now, you have a lot of clothing. Would you expand beyond that? Uh, beyond clothing, absolutely. I think. In the same way that Glossier is a lifestyle brand, we are absolutely building a product, platform, and community to support uh, this new definition of recreation. So approachable activity, activity for fun. So we've started with this tight kind of assortment of product that works across a variety of activities. Um, and we'll continue to develop kind of these kits around more specific activities, uh, but driven through what our customer is, is involved in, what types of activities our customer is involved in. Uh, so the first one that we're, we're working towards is a cycling kit uh, because we've been told the activity that I like most but can't find the product to suit is cycling. Um, and I think similar to you guys, the customer really helps kind of with the product development and kind of the next steps. Uh, in terms of your guys' product roadmap. Yeah, for sure. We, we've actually had two products in the last um, year that we've uh, gotten her involved in. So our Milky Jelly Cleanser and our um, Priming Moisturizer Rich are both skincare products that uh, we, we reached out to her through our various social platforms, I think three different platforms, and, and generated thousands of responses about what she's looking for in her dream face wash. Um, and that's really been, to us, the, the, the best way to, to, to make products that our customers want. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah, for us, um, we take kind of a this kind of customer uh, intel, and then we create a product and, and test it, and we document the process, um, and then use that as kind of marketing fuel, uh, where people are saying, I don't like this seam, it's chafing, or I don't like this material for this type of climate. And so um, that kind of approach with documenting, not creating, has also helped in, in kind of then ultimately releasing new product to the market. And I understand you're looking to expand internationally. Where, are, where what's the next market for Glossier? So the, the first next market will be Canada uh, this summer, and then in October we'll be uh, setting up our, our UK home base for Europe. And one thing that you guys both have in common is that you're, you're female founders with businesses that largely target women, but you've successfully raised venture capital from what's frankly a, a predominantly male-dominated industry. How have you been able to do that, and were there any obstacles that you guys faced in the process? Um, I mean, we, we've raised um, uh, up to a B now, so about um, a little over 35 million in funding from Thrive, IVP, uh, Forerunner, and 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 more. And you know, beauty is not gener uh, traditionally a, a big venture capital um, category, but it is a quarter trillion dollar global market um, that is ripe for disruption. Um, uh, and and so I think really, you know, the the the. The, the data and the stats speak for themselves. I think once you really dig in and you understand you know, that um, what's happening with beauty retail, what's happening with department store beauty counters, um, uh, I think every great beauty brand traditionally, uh, I can name at least three, have started by having a really interesting take on beauty coupled with the adoption of a new channel. Um, and so for us, you know, being the, the, the first brand that has this very you know, millennial-centric kind, of, um, kind of approach and also adopting digital as, as a channel, um, I think you know, they thought we had a pretty good shot. But certainly, it, it's definitely a male-dominated industry, and um, we had to, to really prove ourselves. 
Yeah, the activewear in or space is also run by uh, kind of male-dominated CEOs or male-dominated companies. So I think being a female is a huge advantage, uh, especially since 80% of our customers are female. Like uh, to be a female, you're much closer to understanding what what your customer base really wants. Um, and so it's a huge advantage. We also both share an investor, Kirsten Green from Forerunner, and she's someone we both really look up to. Um, and she was excited. VC of the year, she by was. the way, for TechCrunch. But, yeah, um, I'm really proud of her, but it's, she's a great person and it's a great team yep. to have on our teams. Yep. Did you have any awkward situations, like trying to explain like what makeup like was why, or you know, what people would use these clothing, these outfits for? I mean, for us, it's amazing how excited people get when you put a bag of beauty products on the counter anywhere. Um, I, I think, I think, gender aside, I think you know everyone gets excited about unboxing or unwrapping, you know, a great, a great lip balm that tastes like coconut. Yeah, and we would take people out on on walks and kind of around the block rather than sitting in the boardroom um, or the office, and that really kind of helped spark bonds and create a conversation that people got excited about. So what, are, what have been some of your biggest challenges to running your business? I know that at one point last year, you, it was almost a good problem to have where you had so many people that wanted to buy the Boy Brow product that you had like a 10,000 person wait list, but that also means that you missed out on some revenue. Yep. So have you uh, been better at forecasting <laughs> your we, revenue fixed, lately? Yes. <laughs> fix um, some of those supply we, issues? Yeah, yeah. I mean, last year was our uh, like first real year in business and um, it's really tough to predict, you know, what, what the demand is going to be, especially with, you know, so much of our traffic being socially driven. Um, but, uh, you know, we've, we've definitely hired some amazing, you know, supply chain people from Apple and, um, and various, various masters of, of making sure you, you nail product. Uh, but I think, you know, for us, that, that was definitely a nice problem to have um, for a little while, but we were sold out for of a lot of things. We had up to actually, like, over 40,000 people across waitlists on the site. I think you guys, you know, yeah. you guys too. Um, and so I think it's just, you know, constant, constant learning curve. You just have to keep, keep figuring it out. What have been some of your biggest challenges? I think uh, figuring out how to scale brand. With brand being such um, kind of the kernel of both of our companies, how when you hire a bunch of new people, uh, how, how do you create systems, systems and processes to make sure that that brand and kind of the voice of the brand stays intact? Mm -hmm. um, I would say that yeah. that's been the most challenging, but also where I really like to spend time, so rewarding as well. So as a growing business, have you gotten any acquisition offers? Uh, yes, but we can't talk about them, but <laughs> yes, it's exciting. But you have, you have <laughs> yeah, large absolutely. incumbents probably approaching you all I the think, time. Yeah, I think we're exciting kind of like new energy in both but these big spaces. So I think there are going to be people that um, kind of view the, the community that we're growing um, as a potential asset, absolutely. Mm -hmm. What about you guys? Has anyone tried to buy Glossier? Yes, um, yes, but we're, we're, we're really excited. I mean, I, right now about just, uh, I mean, we're, it's, we're growing very fast and we have a lot that we want to do for our customers. So it's not something that's uh, interesting to us right now. So why are you turning this down? Are you planning to go public someday or what, <laughs> what's in store? No plans right now, just, just building the dream. <laughs> what about outdoor voices? Do you, yeah. do you think you could IPO someday? Absolutely. We want to be the next Nike. Um, and we're focused on building the, the next great activewear brand around recreation. So uh, that's where we have our eyes on that target, and, and that's where we're going. All right. Well, awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.